Those scholars helped us analyze a fossil at that site. A portion of that fossil is out here uh, at our entrance. It was transported all the way back. It's a huge fossilized Aracaria pine tree. They grow around, but this one is compressed. That means the 20 layers above it were laid down while it was still pliable. That means all 20 of those layers are recent. The whole thing is recent. Well, we analyze that. That fossil is in three stages. Total petrified replacement. Then it has carbonized material, still carbon, but it's in a layer that's assigned an age 140 million years by evolutionary interpretation. Somebody's got a problem. Then some of the bark is still fibrous. Still fibrous. That's amazing. How could that bark? Now, the assi we assign that to Noah's flood about 40, a little less than 4,500 years ago, right? David Bassett, a little less than 4,500 years ago. The evolutionary community assigns that 140 million years. Well, how could, how could that bark, some of that bark, remain fibrous even for 4,500 years? It's because it had the capability of secreting fluids that were pest resistant. I'm trying to tell you, the universe sings. It has an incredible dimension to it. Okay, let's get a little more. First Chronicles 16:33 reveals that the trees of the wood sing out at the presence of the Lord. Isaiah 44, 23 states, Sing, O ye heavens, shout ye lower parts of the earth, and the lower parts of the earth are vibrating, uh, because they basically they're moderating in radioactive elements that give off a specific frequency. So they're singing. Uh, ye mountains and the forest of every and every tree therein, so the trees do sing. It is apparent that God sees His creation as a musical composition where even the smallest particles are vibrating and resounding in lovely music that God can hear and enjoy. Now science has found we can hear them along with Him. To me, this is very, very exciting. Music of the spheres. Physicist Robert Whitelow, who wrote the foreword to one of my early books uh, about uh, creation and symphony, uh, physicist Robert Whitelow wrote an extensive technical description of this musical phenomenon in The Waltz of the Planets titled Harmony in the Heavens. In doing so, Professor Whitelow demonstrated that the spherical earth, here it is right there, spherical earth is an integral part of the harmonic scale and stability designed in the structure of the solar system and the universe. Okay, we get to the heart of what I wanted to tell you. There is a movement underfoot, an actual movement. I was surprised. Uh, all the primary creation entities are making statements about it. The earth is spherical. It is not flat. We're going to go into the reasons it was assumed to be flat by certain researchers a century and a half ago. Credentialed astronomer Danny Faulkner, Ph.D., informs us regarding the controversy about a spherical Earth and a flat Earth in, is the Earth flat? He gives compelling reasons why we know the Earth is spherical. I could have, could have quoted various scholars, but he had a very succinct article, and I am giving him full credit appropriately, and uh, the, as long as the citation is, uh, is given, then uh, uh, that that is legal and proper to do. Here we have an actual photograph, a NASA photograph, showing the curvature of the Earth and showing some of the atmospheric uh, response as well. How do we know the Earth is spherical? How do we know it's not a flat Earth? Uh, these individuals espousing a flat Earth assume it to be like a pancake or a disk that is spinning, but it is also uh, going through space, and above it in an arc the sun is spinning, and the planets are spinning around us and the sun in a complicated configuration that will not work with gravitational physics and will not work by observation, but rather than our just saying, oh, that's a bunch of bunk. 
good people have been caught up in this. So I want to show you scientifically and biblically why we're sure the earth is spherical. And Danny Faulkner is one of our very fine uh, research specialists, not ours, but uh, he works with AIG. A, Earth's shadow on the moon demonstrates it's spherical. See that shadow? That's an arc. The question of the Earth's true shape has been settled two millennia, 2,000 years ago, 2,000 years before Columbus, that is, two and a half thousand years ago. The earliest recorded discussion of a spherical Earth is from Pythagoras in the 6th century BC. Pythagoras correctly understood that the cause of lunar eclipses is the shadow of the Earth falling on the moon. And that, of course, is oval. So let's continue. This can happen only when the moon is opposite the sun in our sky, which coincides with full moon. The Earth's shadow is larger than the moon, so we cannot see the entire shadow at once. However, during a lunar eclipse, we see the Earth's shadow creep across the moon. So there, it's creeping and creeping and creeping and creeping and creeping, and the arc changes because the Earth's shadow is larger than this. Because the edge of the Earth's shadow always is a portion of the circle, I want to make sure we get this. This is going up, it's always a portion of the circle. The Earth's shadow must be a circle since we see the portion. Here we have the composite of the series, and when you put it together, only that portion was seen, that portion, that, but you put it all together, and it's very obvious that it is a circle. If the Earth were flat and round, watch, similar to a disk, it could cast a circular shadow. It could, but only for lunar eclipses that occur at midnight. Only. For a lunar eclipse at or near sunrise or at or near sunset, the Earth's shadow would be an ellipse. You'd see it from the side. A line or a rectangle, depending on how thick the disk was compared, was compared to its diameter. You'd see it from the side. But we never see it from the side. Meaning that no matter where you see the Earth's shadow eclipsing the moon, no matter where you see it, it is oval. That means the Earth has to be a sphere. The Earth's shadow during a lunar eclipse is always a circle, a portion of the circle, the rest of it going like that, regardless of the time of night when the eclipse occurs. The only shape that consistently has a circular shadow regardless of its orientation is a sphere.